Hello, hello, welcome to Rachel Paints Poorly. My name is Rachel and I paint poorly. Y'all, it's so cold. It's winter in the Midwest and it's cold. Every year it's cold and every year I'm surprised it's cold and every year I complain that it's cold. I did go to the local nursery and look at all of the tropical house plants though, so that was nice. Today, I'm going to be painting Henry de toulouse lautrecs Moulin Rouge Le Goulou, first painted in 1891. Many of you are probably familiar with the Moulin Rouge, a cabaret adorned by a windmill located in the Montmartre district of Paris, where Nicole Kidman and Ian McGregor surmounted insurmountable odds with the power of love and some catchy pop songs. Come on, get in here, dummy. Okay, where was I? Satine and Christian might have been entirely fictional characters, but others are based in reality. Jim Broadbent's Harold Zidler is similar to Charles Zidler, a co-founder of the Moulin Rouge. Carolyn O'Connor's Nini Legs in the Air was a real performer. Nini Le Pat in Luer, and John Leguizamo's Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec parallels the French artist of the same name. The real Henry was no struggling actor, however, but an aristocrat turned professional artist whose notoriety sprung from his unflinching portrayal of the Parisian underworld. Many of his works feature the inhabitants of the Moulin Rouge, where he frequented so often a table was permanently reserved for his use. So who was Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec, and how did he come to create Moulin Rouge La Goulou? Henry Marie Raymond de Toulouse-Lautrec Monfa was born on November 24th, 1864, to Count Alphonse de Toulouse-Lautrec Monfa and Countess Adèle Tapie de Celeron at the family's medieval town residence, the Chateau de Bosque at Albi. Tracing their lineage to the times of Charlemagne, Henry's family lived a life of quiet leisure, hunting, hosting parties, and dabbling in music and art. His father was a passionate hunter and horseman and wished for his son to follow in his footsteps. Alas, it was not meant to be. In 1878, at the age of 13, Henry broke his right thigh bone. A year later, he broke his left. His legs ceased to grow after, and he never grew taller than five foot one inch, or 152 centimeters. His injuries confirmed what his family had hoped to ignore. Henry had inherited pycnatosostosis, a bone disease resulting from multi-generational intermarriage in his family. His own parents were first cousins. But some good did come from an admittedly bad situation. During his long periods of rest and recovery, Henry began developing a talent that he had displayed since he was six, drawing. At 14, his first oil paintings showed everyday sights around the family estate, horses, dogs, and the family property. At 17, he decided he wanted to be a painter. On the advice of his painter friends, Henry's father permitted him to travel to Paris for academic training. He began in April of 1882 in the studio of Leon Bonnet, who told him, quote, Your paintings aren't bad, which is fine, although it still means they are simply not bad, but your drawings are utterly appalling, end quote. In December, after Bonnet had to close his studio, Henry went to study under Fernand Cormon. Eager to exhibit his work, he showed Un Petit Accident in 1883 under the name Monfa. His submission to the Salon later that year, however, was rejected. Though he took to ridiculing the stuffy academic art of the Salon while simultaneously enjoying the breeze of Impressionism, Henry did not align himself with any one painting style over the others, instead systematically adding new components to his art. In addition to dabbling in plein air, Henry began experimenting with the pointillism of Georges Seurat and was greatly influenced by the lines and viewpoints found in the work of Impressionist Edgar Degas. Similar to Degas, Henry preferred painting the figure over landscapes. His success in securing portrait commissions was rather lackluster, however, due in part to wealthy women being wary of his reputation for rather brutal honesty in depicting his sitters. Maurice Joyant, Henry's friend and later art dealer, commented, quote, Henry's obtaining portrait commissions was in vain. After a few sessions, the great ladies, first attracted by a curious legend, fled from the tyranny of the painter, who cruelly and mercilessly stripped them down to a look that was not pretty. End quote. Absent such women, Henry turned to those of lesser repute, the unfortunate denizens of the underbelly of Parisian society. One of the first was Carmen Gaudin, a working class girl he met in 1884. He was initially drawn to her red hair, an attraction that would span his career with multiple female models. 
Carmen might not have raised eyebrows, but another woman certainly did. Louise Weber, commonly known as Le Goulou, or The Glutton, for her charming habit of downing patrons' drinks in a single gulp. A star of the Moulin Rouge, Le Goulou was not the first lowbrow subject found in Henry's art. He had been visiting brothels and painting the prostitutes found within since 1887, but her image helped Henry's popularity around Paris. The 1891 poster, almost six feet high, appeared on the walls throughout the city, around 3,000 in total. They were so admired that people began stripping them from the walls and taking them home. One person who saw them felt the opposite, Henry's father, who recognized his son's signature. Furious at Henry's debasement of the family name by using his artistic talents to advertise a disreputable establishment filled with scandalous performers, which, I mean, he wasn't wrong, the already strained relationship between the two men only worsened. Today, the poster is seen as a masterwork of the art form, a trailblazer in the history of poster design, and a showcase for Henry's excellence as a draughtsman. And so, without further ado, let's get started, shall we? Only the figure exists. Landscape is and should only be an accessory. The pure landscape painter is just crude. The landscape should only be used to better understand the character of the figure. Corot is not better without figures, and the same for the rest. Millet, Renoir, Manet, Whistler, and when the painters of the figure create a landscape, they treat it like a face. Degas' landscapes are incredible because these are dream landscapes. Those of Carrier are like human masks. Manet has abandoned the figure, which is what not to do. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Henri was fascinated by character and the pointed depiction of such, and he frequently turned his keen eye on La Goulou, whom he met when she was just 16. She had been hired as a performer by Charles Zidler, after her rise to notoriety as a particularly salacious dancer of the Chau, a form of the can-can. Of La Goulou, his artist friend and frequent companion to the Moulin Rouge, Francois Gazi, stated, quote, It was her enormous appetite that earned her this nickname, the glutton, attracted the greatest number. Encased in her blonde hair and décolleté down to the navel, she strode into the dance hall like a conqueror. She danced with a vulgar elegance, and gesticulated with her foot, which she maintained vertically above her head, and then brought the dance to a close by letting herself flop with legs apart, the upper half of her body erect, her arms raised triumphantly to the sky." End quote. In Moulin Rouge, La Goulou, Henry depicts the dancer high-kicking during a performance of the Chau, revealing her black stockings and frilly white undergarments, which, on occasion, she was known to leave off, further adding to her reputation. Silhouettes are used for the audience in the background and the man in the foreground, a technique inspired by the popular shadow theaters and the Japanese woodblock prints by Kitagawa Utamaro, one of Henry's favorite printmakers. The thin form of the silhouetted man belonged to Jacques Renoudan, possibly a wine merchant by day. At night, he was an amateur dancer known as Valentin Ludisosi, or Valentin the Boneless, whose slender frame and long limbs lent his contortionist movements a certain fluidity, as if he were boneless. Dressed in a black suit and top hat, he was Lagulu's regular dance partner. Henry may have created the poster for a competition put on by Charles Ziegler to advertise the Moulin Rouge. Ziegler wanted the focus to be on the performers, who were the main draw for the crowds. Henry's design was the winner, as selected by Ziegler. When Henry took to designing posters in 1891, lithography already had an established history of nearly a century. It was invented in 1796 by Alois Senefelder, who developed a technique of printing from stone. He did so by drawing on porous limestone with fatty chalk, moistening the blank areas, then covering the whole with fatty colored printing ink. The moistened parts were then left free from color. Over the following decades, the process was made more exact through the use of chemicals. Henry's lengthy preparation to create Moulin Rouge La Goulou is evident in the surviving studies and sketches. These include paintings, pastel and watercolor drawings, sketches, and lithographs, all showing variations of dancing and of La Goulou and Valentin. In addition to posters, Henry also created lithographs for the theater and its performers, as well as personal pieces from experiences that he wished to preserve. 
The silhouettes and flat color blocks may have been from Udamaro, but Henry's use of unexpected composition in thinned oil on cardboard was from Degas. According to Gazi, Henry had managed to be introduced to Degas, who, quote, always guarded his door like a bear guarding his den. While Cormon was correcting his drawings, Degas was giving him advice. The master himself had, when he was young, submitted his drawings to Ingres for his opinion, and he had said, draw lines, lines, lines from the life or from memory, and you will become a great artist. One must suppose that Degas, in like manner, has said to Lautrec, draw, draw, and go on drawing. Lautrec had his pencil between his fingers always. End quote. While Gazi overrated Degas' regard for Henry, Henry forever maintained his estimation of Degas. As he matured, so did his methods of depicting movement, be it of jockeys on horses or of performances by dancers like Jane Avril, with whom he was good friends. He also expanded beyond Degas' anonymous dancers and infused his subjects with character and personality, the result of astute observation and an honesty in portrayal sometimes in a manner too close for comfort. When asked by Messia Nattinson why he made his women so ugly, he replied, quote, because they are ugly, end quote. For the majority of his life, Henry was known for his ready wit and sense of humor, gaining him access to society and providing a defense against the barbs that might have been thrown his way due to his appearance, the result of his genetic makeup. Henry Van de Velde said, quote, Photographs of this stunted little man have been seen all over the world. Only his head and trunk are grown normally. His head looked as if it had been screwed on to his sagging shoulders. His full black beard had the effect of some strange adornment. His arms and legs were those of a six-year-old. Yet in this stunted body there was an extreme vitality that almost went beyond Toulouse Lautrec's spirit. His rapid wit, the wit of a malicious clown, was staggering. His mouth was of an animal sensuality, his way of talking now uncontrolled, now pointed and witty, now totally unconventional." End quote. Despite his physical weakness and ill health, Henry was fueled by the energy in the locations and people he sought out, often exclaiming, ah, life, life. Sadly, his way of life would catch up with him. The bar hopping, sleepless nights, and copious amounts of alcohol took their toll. The warnings of his friends went unheeded, even spurned, and his success in alienating those around him only increased his isolation. In addition to his inherited condition, his final years were plagued by syphilis, then incurable, paranoia, and a changed personality. Early in 1899, at the age of 35, he collapsed in the street, and on February 27th, he was taken to a mental hospital at the request of his family. Terrified that he would be locked away for the rest of his life, he begged his father and his friends to arrange for his release, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. In the end, Henry determined to prove that he was well enough to leave by creating a series of circus drawings done in chalk, which he worked from memory. They were enough to prove his case, and he was released on May 17th, on the condition that he would not be left alone. To prevent a relapse, his distant relative, Paul Viad, volunteered as his companion, and the two set off on a series of travels. In 1901, Henry briefly returned to Paris, where he set his affairs in order. In mid-August, he suffered from a stroke. Partially paralyzed, he returned to his mother's home, Chateau Malraux, on August 20th. Countess Adele knew her son would die before long. So did the Count, who hurried to his son's bedside. He wrote to René Pronsteau, a family friend and Henry's first art teacher, quote, I expect to leave as early as possible tonight, or tomorrow at the latest, to visit my poor son Henry. His legs have been useless for the past few months. He was dragging himself along. His arms were still strong, however, and he was able to paint energetically. Just yesterday, he asked for some easels and brushes, but his hands refused to serve him. If he lasts until the first autumn frosts, he will not survive them, because it's his lungs that are diseased. Three months ago, several experts diagnosed him as consumptive. So the end is very near." End quote. Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec died on September 9, 1901. He was 36 years old. Acknowledging his failures as a father in light of his son's death, the Count gave over the rights to Henry's estate to Maurice Joyant, writing, quote, I'm not making a generous gesture in giving you all my paternal rights 
if there are any as heir of whatever our deceased produced. Your brotherly friendship had so quietly replaced my weak influence that I am being logical in continuing this charitable role for you if you so desire, simply for the satisfaction of your kind-heartedness toward your classmate. So I have no plans to change my opinion and, now that he is dead, praise to the sky something that during his life I could only regard as audacious, daring studio sketches." End quote. Henry's contribution to French art was much more than mere audacious studio sketches, of course. It was his portrayal of lowbrow subjects and the world they lived in, in a manner befitting that of high art. The performers and their audiences existed in a shared space common and aristocratic. They came together in both the cabarets and dives they inhabited, and in the paintings and posters found in Henry's oeuvre. During the last years of his life, Maurice Joyant had encouraged Henry to exhibit in London, in the hopes that it would provide a distraction from his serious drinking habit. The exhibition opened on May 1, 1898. British art critic H. Snowden Ward wrote, quote, Messrs. Boussard, Valadin, and Company of the Goupil Gallery, Lower Regent Street, exhibit a collection of the works by M. Toulouse-Lautrec, one of the most extreme followers of Degas. His subjects are unlikely to commend themselves to old ladies, but their execution is undeniably clever." End quote. Henry once commented to his cousin, the first human being to invent a mirror, put it upright, for the simple reason that he wanted to look at himself full length. A mirror of that kind is very well and good, because it is useful and need be nothing more than useful. Later, other people came and said, up till now, people have set up their mirrors perpendicularly without ever wondering why they did so. They found that mirrors can be put horizontally on their sides, naturally, although the question is whether there is any point in doing so. They did it because it was novel, and it was the novelty that appealed to them, but nothing is ever beautiful because it is novel. In our time, there are many artists who go for novelty, and see their value and justification for novelty, but they are wrong. Novelty is hardly ever important. What matters is always just the one thing, to penetrate to the very heart of a thing and create it better. And there you have it, Moulin Rouge La Goulou. Thank you so much for watching. As always, thumbs up if you liked that video, and if you have not already done so, please subscribe for more content, both like this and other cool stuff that I do on occasion. And you wouldn't want to miss that, no indeed. Also, if you so desire, you can follow me over on Instagram at rachelpaintsporly. Until next time, bye. Satine and Christian might have been based in reality. No, that's not right.